Thanks a lot for joining us today. Welcome everybody. Also from my side, I'm heading the International Environmental Policy Division at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and we are following um, yeah, what is happening on raw materials policy closely. And what we can see at the moment is that raw materials have become a very hot topic in the past years, especially since the aggression, aggression of Russia on the Ukraine. Many countries are changing their um, raw material strategies. For example, 2011, the EU still tried with its raw materials initiative, still tried to use trade instruments to access the raw materials from China. And last year, the EU got a new strategy, um, the EU, uh, the Critical Raw Materials Act, um, that marks a change at this strategy. And it says that it tries um, to get more independent from China. And this has a lot of impacts on EU neighboring countries and other countries because the EU is looking for supply in other countries. And um, yeah, the, um, this Critical Raw Materials Act has different pillars. It look, it goes for, it uses strategic projects where countries and companies can co companies can apply for projects within their territories to become strategic, um, and then get more support. Um, and there's also a raw materials partnerships. Um, that for example, there's one with the EU and Serbia, and the EU, yeah, is using different strategies to get access to these raw materials. We are a bit worried about this at the moment, how low the standards are that are demanded in this context. Um, first of all, for these strategic projects, they ask, um, there is a UNFC uh, rating in the beginning, which doesn't really put a lot of uh, um, focus on ESG standards, and then it can be enough for projects to become strategic projects to go with certification schemes if they are outside of the EU. And what we are seeing at the moment is that there is a huge um, competition among different countries wanting to access these resources, and this often yeah, goes doesn't go in favor of high standards. And at the same time, we see often that civil society um, is seen as one actor that should make sure that human rights <laughs> are not abused, that the ecosystems are not destroyed. And at the same time, we see that the space for civil society is shrinking more and more. And I think that's something we can also see in the different cases. And I don't want to talk more uh, about this now and head over to our authors. Uh, um, authors. And um, we uh, also want to highlight that we are in a webinar here at the moment, we want to give you inputs on the situation in the different countries. And then we would uh, very much like to come into a discussion with you as well. We will record this webinar. So if you don't want to be shown in picture, um, you are very welcome to um, show your picture. But if you don't want to be on the um, video later, um, please put it, uh, yeah, um, don't put the video. And um, yeah. Heading over, I want first want we will first talk about uh, Georgia, uh, then Armenia, go over to Bosnia and then to Serbia. And um, Katie, we have you. You have been the author on the chapter on uh, uh, on Georgia, and you have worked in the on environmental protection since twenty years, and you have experience in non governmental work and with the organization Green Alternative. Uh, you, you work all have also. Worked in um, you have also experience in governmental work and in the office of the Parliamentarian Committee on Environmental Protection, Natural Resources, as well as in the Environmental Policy Department of the Ministry of Environmental Protection and Natural Resources of Georgia. And you hold a degree uh, at the university, a uh, master's degree in, of the university in Tbilisi and Lund University. We are very glad to have you here and to um, have you having uh, contributed to um to the publication and we know that the situation for civil society is very difficult at the moment in Georgia and I would like to pass you the word uh, to um hear about the current situation the raw materials uh, uh, situation in um in Georgia and also the role, yeah the role of civil society at the moment and the challenges for civil society at the moment thanks for being here <clears throat> thank you Johanna uh, I will share my presentation can everyone see the slide? Yeah. So um, uh, the Georgian mining sector is uh, basically comprised of uh, extraction of construction materials, 
uh, where 90% of licenses are awarded and uh, mining of metals and minerals on the uh, and on the right side of the slide, you can see the list of metals and minerals that are currently mined or considered feasible to mine. In uh, 2020, with mining contribution index, right, um, with mining contribution index, the national economy ranked 28 among um, 120, uh, 182 countries. And you may wonder why Georgia is in top 30 countries while uh, mining comprises only 1.90% of GDP. And the answer uh, lays in the exports. About 30% of Georgia's exports are metal and mineral related. At the moment, multilateral uh, donors are not investing in the mining projects, though some are going to, but they are assisting in institutional development of the sector. Um, I have to also mention that the association agreement includes specific article on cooperation in the mining sector. Uh, and uh, we have to also recall that Georgia was granted candidate status in December 2023, but Georgia's EU perspective is now threatened by democratic backsliding and anti-democratic steps taken by the current Georgian dream government. For you to have a uh, general understanding of the Georgian mining sector, I listed some of the major developments taking place during two last two decades. Uh, from 2007 to 1st January 2018, for 10 years, mining projects were exempt from environmental impact assessment and any type of environmental assessment. Processing was still subject to EIA, though public was deprived of a right to participate in environmental permitting. And in 2005, in order to ensure easy access to the land, eminent domain law was amended to allow expropriation of private property by the state if minerals are discovered on the private land. In general, environmental, social, and labor aspects of the mining operations remain largely underregulated, especially when it comes to the mining of construction materials. And to demonstrate low credibility and sustainability of Georgian mining sector governance, I have to mention that during the last two years, responsibilities of mining regulation have been transferred uh, from one agency to another agency several times. And um, also I am, wanted to show this graph that shows how many times the major reg regulating mining licensing was amended. And as you see, it was amended every year, several times a year, and sometimes even several times in a month. Uh, and when it comes to the transparency in the, uh, in the sector, I have to mention that the first ever national mining strategy that was adopted in 2019 was developed and adopted without any public consultation. Um, and uh, uh, as you seen and uh, see uh, the graph, I showed the regulation on mining licensing is permanently amended to serve different needs and interests, though never with uh, public consultation. And as to the decision making at the project level, licenses are awarded through online auctions to the highest bidder, and public has no influence over the process. And the result of total lack of transparency and accountability in the mining sector. Uh, have been vividly seen these days in the capital city, in front of the in front of the parliament. Um, Georgian manganese uh, company mines manganese directly beneath uh, the villages, and uh, these people are protesting for five years now. The, the latest protest takes seven months, and there for more than forty days they are on hunger strike because their houses are being collapsing and um, livelihoods are being destroyed. I want to show, quickly show some of the pictures to, to have an understanding what's going on in the spot. So this is what's happening because of manganese mining. Uh, this is river passing through the villages, which is really a river. I have to assure you that I have not photoshopped it. This is black, absolutely black. And you can see this is effluent discharge point from the processing factory. 
So you can see the difference between the colors. What what how, what is the color of the river before and what is the color of the river after the effluent point uh, anchors the river. Uh, and this is the area. Um, uh, the area under under license. So you can see these uh, these villages are under license, and most of the villages were already destroyed, and some are some some will be destroyed during next um, uh, during next uh, years. Uh, manganese mining in Tura actually is not new. It was uh, mined in uh, since nineteenth century and during Soviet times also, but. The, the site was extended in 2006, uh, and it was given to the Fujian Manganese Company for 40 years. Uh, it has extended from 3,000 hectares to 16,000 hectares, and it covers uh, the lands of uh, many villages in Tatura and Sachkhara municipalities. In 2006, this decision was taken without any consultation and any communication with affected communities. Uh, and, uh, I have to just briefly mention current challenges uh, we have in the mining sector. Um, some, some efforts have been taken in recent years to fight against the regulation, but these efforts are not enough and they are too slow. Uh, current policy regulatory and oversight systems remain underregulated. They are not addressing negative impacts of the mining on people and the environment. Um, curing of construction material has expanded over the last two years. Last Two decades, I would say, and um, but, uh, it it wasn't followed better regulation, and it needs a really urgent uh, response and transparency and accountability in the mining sector at all levels should be in the forefront of the agenda, including in the cooperation agenda. Uh, this is shortly about Georgia. And I'm ready to answer your questions afterwards. Yes, thank you. Thank you a lot, Katie, on this. Maybe you could also quickly go into the aspect on the situation of civil society at the moment, just to let us all know how um, you work at the moment and how you can follow up on this project at the moment. Well, uh, I mean, the situation is really difficult, as you may all know. But, uh, we, the Georgian government and parliament, adopted the new law Foreign influence, foreign influence and also so-called anti-LGBTQ plus law, which are both, I mean, uh, against all the democratic procedures and all the human rights. And um, yes, we are waiting for the elections, parliamentary elections on, we have in two weeks time in, on 26th of October and everyone is mobilized. Uh, the, the, uh, the opposition party, the civil society, uh, to 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 defeat this current uh, the, the current ruling party, so um, let's see what happens in two weeks time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks a lot for this, and maybe in the next round we will also go a bit more into what can we do now and what are options. Also, what should the EU do? Yeah. Um, before this, we go over to I would um make the round on um having the different panoramas of the country, and then we go into the discussion on this further on. I would like to head over to now jump from, from Georgia to Armenia to author Gregorian. Uh, and um, you are working um, at the, currently working at the Ecological Rights um, uh, NGO um, called Ecological Rights. And before you were a researcher and chair of, F of the Ethics Committee of Transparency International Anti-Corruption Center. And you have also been president and program coordinator at Eco Rights Armenia and um, uh, yeah, and have hold uh, Armenia accountable for the ne negative impacts of mining and on, uh, on public health and biodiversity. We are very pleased to have you here today, Arthur, and um, yeah, heading over the word to you. And also from you, I would like to have an overview of the raw material situation at the moment and also the role of civil society in this. Yeah. The moment. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, as we are very short of time to present this uh, presentation. So uh, I will generally outline uh, the overall picture of uh, mining in Armenia, and then we can get into the details during the discussion. So uh, just to uh, 
indicate that in terms of critical raw materials, Armenia exports uh, copper. Generally, we export five types of uh, materials. It's uh, gold, silver, molybdenum, zinc, and copper. But the majority, I mean, the biggest volume uh, among these materials is copper, which is listed as critical. Uh, so just general... Uh, uh, general couple of numbers, 25% of overall export from Armenia is copper, and among the raw materials exported, more than 60% is copper. It's just uh, to let you know that the, this critical raw material is, 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 is uh, the, the biggest volume of uh, Armenian export. So, uh, but we have lots of issues with regards to the mining and um, as Katy presented, some uh, social and environmental issues. It's similar uh, for Armenia as well. We are neighboring, neighboring countries. Uh, so we have uh, environmental problems, connected social issues, and of course, uh, Her Majesty corruption uh, in the sector. So just to outline these three issues, uh, from the point of view of environment, so uh, there are the different reports, uh, World Bank reports, uh, reports of American University of Armenia uh, generated by these organizations, these institutions, uh, showing how much environmental concerns mining is uh, is doing. So uh, if you go into the report, you can see that there is no, not a single tiling dam which is the uh, mine waste facility. There is not a single tiling dam which is constructed uh, in, in line with the uh, European standards. There is not a single uh, mine site which is being operated in line with the social and environmental uh, standards of the EU and European countries. So we have this uh, huge problem with the environmental impact and as you know, the environmental impacts are bringing the social impact. So if the water is polluted, uh, it goes to the uh, food chain, you know, through the irrigation and uh, uh, other other pollution. And of course, there, there, there are public health issues. Uh, there is no differentiation in terms of uh, mining licensing where uh, the mine site will be, uh, I mean, the mining activity will be permitted. For instance, we have health resort in central uh, Armenia and just next to that health resort, uh, there is a mining permitting. And there are huge, huge problems with regard to um, civil society participation. Uh, about uh, the mining the, during the mining licensing, which brings to uh, even the clashes between uh, civil society and residents of local communities, affected communities, and uh, mining company and police and you know state institutions. Uh, so recently, World Bank and by the support of the World Bank, a new mining strategy was uh, adopted, was developed and adopted by the government. Uh, 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 but I would say that uh, this mining strategy wouldn't uh, anyhow touch the critical problems, critical social and environmental problems which society has. So it doesn't resolve anything. So currently we have a situation when, from the one of one, one of the one, from the one point of view, is there is an existing mining operation which is being done very badly. And we have uh, absolutely different picture how the new mines will be operated, but there is no trust among the people. So that's why uh, people are opposing, they are protesting everywhere, just in any village, in any community, when a mining company appears uh, wanting to, wanting to uh, even even explore uh, explore new deposits. Uh, civil society and affected communities right there, just kicking them out. Just to, we don't we don't want to see you here. So here uh, there are um, huge problems with the communication with environmentalists, civil society organizations, uh, local communities, and mining companies. Uh, with regard to critical raw materials issue uh, of course europe is interested that from the third countries the critical raw materials uh, would go would flow uh, to uh, the eu and to europe to europe because of green green transition energy trans transition you know but still uh, 
Uh, the main concern in, is that if the current practice is in there, uh, people will never uh, allow uh, exploration and exploitation of new uh, deposits. So the main thing which needs to be done is to equalize more or less, more or less, equalize the European standards with the national standards. And uh, not only on the paper, but also on practice. Because again, I'm in indicating the World Bank paper or the World Bank strategy, uh, which shows how uh, good and how in line with the social environmental issues will be a new uh, mining, uh, you know, uh, new mines if they are developed. But there is severe lack of trust and never new mines will be operated unless the existing practice of uh, social and environmental uh, Issues is, are are not changed and are not aligned with the uh, with the practice which they um, anticipate to have in the future. So uh, again, I can I can go to the corruption as well. Do we have time? Just a couple of minutes, one or two minutes. Uh, one minute, okay. Um, uh, well, again, this is post-Soviet country, and the Soviet type of systemic corruption is there. So uh, we have uh, lots of situations, lots, lots of uh, cases when uh, former high level officials are the owners of uh, mining companies, such as the former minister of environment, former uh, head of, uh, I mean, the governor of one of the provinces. And currently we have a scandal again, when the prime minister, existing prime minister himself is involved in a corrupt deal uh, concerning the, um, the rotation of shares of one of the mining companies, the biggest mining company uh, in Armenia. By the way, uh, initially it was German owned and after so-called uh, revolution, uh, when so-called pro-Western government started uh, ruling the country and uh, then uh, unexpected, unexpectedly uh, these shares yeah, went from German company to Russian company. So. Uh, that's it. We can discuss it uh, later on more in detail. Thanks a lot um, for this. And um, we will go more deeper into what can happen now after in the next round. And I want to pass uh, the word to Maida Ibrakovic. And uh, Maida, thanks for being here with us. You're presently coordinating 40 network members of the Ecoforum Zenik in Zenikcha uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And you hold a master's degree in uh, geography and you're currently also uh, a bachelor degree in geography and you're currently also a master's student at degrowth ecology economy and policy at the uh, universidad uh, universidad autonoma in barcelona and before you have been coal phase out campaigner um, since many years and you have been advocating for a clean energy transition Please uh, hand the word over to you. The same, um, please tell us a little bit about the raw material situation at the moment and also the role of civil society in this context. Thank you very much, Johanna, and greetings to everyone. Uh, I will just uh, make a small remark. Our network is uh, called Echo Beha, uh, comprising of 40 environmental associations, and Echo Forum is one of them. I'm currently engaged in this environmental association. So, uh, because of us, uh, short time, I will just speak generally about the uh, issues in Bosnia and Herzegovina around mining and environmental issues. So, um, yeah, as you see in the map, the, we have a quite um, we have a quite complex political context, and you see this uh, um, line uh, that kind of divides two entity levels, which are co which are regulating the mining and environmental uh, regulations and, and legislation in the country. So there is no specific state regulation on mining and on environment, which makes it uh, quite complicated uh, for the authorities to actually regulate uh, mining concessions and the concession uh, contracting, contracting in extremely complex. Uh, in one entity, part of, uh, generally the, the lower part of the country is a federation and it's consisted of 10 cantons and each of these cantons are giving out the concession uh, contracts for uh, different uh, different types of activities including mining and extraction and exploration activities uh, so the investments in mining could be quite challenging if you consider that there are complex levels of licensing but then again it can also be rewarding uh, depending on the level of corruption uh, in the country 
which we are uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is actually uh, by data from Transparency International the first uh, in the region by corruption and third in Europe after Ukraine and Russia. So uh, there are uh, very worrying and um, concerning uh, grounds for developing new mining. Transparency, just as colleagues mentioned in Georgia and Armenia is uh, uh, actually sometimes even non-existing or there is no proper public consultation, consultation uh, uh, regarding different uh, project uh, projects that are developing uh, in, in these regions or locally. Uh, also important to mention in the political context, also we don't have a, well, we had, don't have a state state um, mining regulation on environmental uh, regulation. We also don't have an environmental agency on a state level whatsoever. We have only ministries. So that means we are quite low on data, on data access regarding mining, regarding environment, regarding uh, even human rights. And obviously we are facing uh, shrinking civic space and uh, abolition of human rights, especially in the regions where new mining uh, projects are being planned. Uh, I also mentioned in the report, my, my colleague and me, uh, we mentioned that there is a new uh, warning legislation developed in one entity, Republic of Sistema, which is more north, uh, that involves uh, changes of this law that uh, have some critical articles within it exempting local authorities from giving any type of consent for new mining projects for exploration, but obviously also extraction that would come afterwards. So this is very worrying, and this law was adopted, unfortunately, a few months ago, although there was a, a civic, uh, civil uh, society um, interventions and protests, but unfortunately, it was adopted. I want to also mention that uh, re regarding GDP, uh, the mining industry Sometimes less than two percent of the GDP, but exports, similar to other countries to mentioned before, exports of ore and related metal products are uh, up to come up to twenty-two percent uh, of all total exports from the country. Meaning that mining industry is becoming more and more interesting for different investments, uh, foreign, of course, investors uh, coming mostly from. Uh, Great Britain, from uh, Australia, um, and nowadays also from Switzerland, which is the lithium project. I want to say the context that formerly abandoned mining sites developed before the war in the 90s become new sites for exploration and, and exploitation. These are mostly depopulated uh, areas, uh, economically devastated by war input, but on the other hand, some of them are planned for protection in their spatial plans because of exceptional biodiversity richness. Uh, some of the traditional ores uh, being excavated before and nowadays are iron, bauxite, lead, zinc, barium, barite, precious ones as silver and gold, and the so-called critical and strategic ones are the new uh, mining uh, areas planned for extraction. Those are the magnesium, lithium, boron, nickel, copper, cobalt uh, projects, which you can also see in the map, uh, because we are kind of talking about the protein mines in the country that developed in the past 10 years. These are the, as you see, Varesh projects, the silver, zinc, zinc, and lead mine that started operating this year. And another project of lead in Olova. These are British companies that are already causing um, devastating uh, environmental uh, um, measures. Um, uh, there are um, some already um, biodiversity losses. Um, polluted groundwater coming from the exploration, especially with the lithium project in Lopare, which is uh, on the east, and very much in the same uh, lithium deposit as uh, the one in Serbia. So it's on the border with Serbia, as you can see. Uh, some other environmental problems that are occurring uh, are obviously, I already mentioned that the projects are planned in protected sites, that the sites that should be protected uh in spatial plans and these sites are also water abundant areas with protected watersheds that are obviously jeopardized by the new mining uh, um, planning sites and uh, i want to specifically say about the situation for the civil society and mobilization the movement and mobilization is uh, not yet statewide meaning in mobilization of the complete complete state 
uh, and uh, cities that are more obviously far away from these uh, mining projects that are being developed. But there is quite uh, resistance happening in local context, uh, local campaigns uh, developing, especially in this, uh, you can see Osman region, which is uh, not in the center, but more um, uh, close uh, to uh, Petrovo and Doboy, with more on, on the uh, north part of the country uh in Osran, Osran is a mountain and Mayavitsa is a mountain as well uh these mountains uh, are uh, should be protected in the spatial <clears throat> planning sites and uh there is currently ongoing research happening uh in order to protect these sites and to obviously prevent any new mining happening uh, in these areas so i want to emphasize that many projects are happening some activists also got slapped in these processes. Um, some uh, lawsuits were dropped by the companies themselves because of lack of arguments. So uh, many involvements are happening and there is also involvement and, and promotion coming also from some EU institutions without which I would actually uh, maybe um, uh, say more uh, in the second round. Thank you, Maida. Um, thanks a lot for this. And we now go, go to uh, Serbia. To Predrag, and um, we, I think this has probably been the example which you have heard most of now in the past month in media, also here in Germany and other European countries. And um, th um, thanks a lot for being here, Predrag. You also wrote the chapter on Serbia in, uh, in the um, in our in the study. You hold a degree in partial planning at the from the University of Belgrade, and you're currently working on a PhD on political and social ecology. And you have been journalist since 2014, and um, you are also the executive director of the Center of Green Politics in Serbia since 2022. Please, I hand over to you. Thanks for the invitation and hello from the Belgrade. And yeah, you probably heard about the, this case of lithium in Serbia because I would start that lithium, it's become the word in Serbia society. And from this, you will think maybe our oh, Serbia is leader in some process of energy transition, which is not true. Still, like more than seventy percent of coal electricity and energy is coming from brown coal. Or you would think that we at least have some kind of debate about this, this uh, energy transition and green transition. This is also not true, but it's mostly because. People, a lot of people are opposing to this project about potential of exploitation uh, of lithium. Uh, and every day it's happening new and new things in Serbia. And my, my article in this report, it's already a little bit outdated. There you can find more uh, data about uh, mining in Serbia and history and some other things. But uh, for example, uh, Last week, we had parliamentary or try of parliamentary debate uh, about the, this uh, lithium project in Western Serbia in Yadar. You will see on the border with Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, because it was pretty much failure of this parliamentary debate, th this week we will have, uh, uh, again, protest in Loznica. And in last few years in Serbia, we had uh, several big protests and blockades uh, uh, connected with this question of exploitation of lithium. Uh, and to go back a little bit in history, the, the, this mine of uh, lithium is discovered in Western Serbia beginning of 2000s. And then you had the, this company Rio Tinto who were do, doing exploration things for, for decades. And then in 2020, they announced that they, they want to exploit lithium mine in Western Serbia. And people don't trust them and uh, neither local people, neither uh, general population of Serbia, but they also don't trust Serbian government, which is really authoritarian government, which don't want to, to have really uh, democratic debate about this. And uh, then uh, because big protests and blockades, people in Serbia managed to stop this project in 2022 when the government signed that they are stopping. But now uh, after June and we had the local and regional elections and the same governing party uh, won, but because it's also election fraud, that uh, they reopened this uh, process. And nowadays in the media, you have all, uh, all the time uh, to talk about lithium and mostly in positive way. 
and uh, also uh, the, the, this caused a new wave of protest and blockades which started also again from from Loznica, this town in Western Serbia, but also during the Ju July and June we had all over the Serbia, which culminate with big protests in Belgrade, 10th of August, where more than 50,000 people were on the streets of Belgrade during the summertime. And uh, now, uh, the, the, this goes also to, to pretty repressive uh, measurements of government because during the August, more than 50, uh, 40, 50 uh, uh, activists were detained or uh, arrested because they, they were uh, supporting uh, protests or blockades in Belgrade. And now, now this, this, there are still some of them on, on a court and uh, fighting for this. And also the, there is, I would say, more and more attack uh, on civil society uh, because on uh, on pro-governmental media, that they, they are all the time writing and talking about civil societies organization. And they are again uh, creating this narrative. Oh, some, some people paid from abroad, want to stop progress of Serbia. Uh, and th 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 this is what, what become common narrative. And also uh, during th this parliamentary debate where uh, all opposition uh, members of parliament from uh, right to, to left, they proposed uh, th this law to, to stop uh, lithium exploration and exploitation. Uh, but they were unsuccessful in the, the, this. There were also a lot of labeling of activists in a national parliament by pro, uh, pro by governmental uh, members of parliament that they were targeting them and civil society organizations. And we expect it will continue in uh, in next months. Uh, and uh, just to, to give brief explanation why people in Serbia are against the, this project, and I would not uh, say that people are generally against uh, uh, green transition or energy transition, but they are wondering for whom uh, the, the, this lithium will be and who will drive the, these electric cars, because with average standard, they are pretty sure... Uh, uh, they will not uh, drive the, the, these cars and they are also afraid because this uh, really bad track record of Rio Tinto company that they will only get environmental degradation and paying for social costs and that they will not so be big benefit for a local community. And for, for them, I think for whole Serbian society, it's important to have uh, to talk also about this fairness and democratical aspect of energy transition. I will stop now to have more time for, for discussion. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. There's a lot of <laughs> lot to, uh, of input here now. Um, before, um, please, if you have any question, um, 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 to really be safe that they are, we really can take them into account, please put them into the chat or also in the Advent uh, A tool. And I, before in a quick round, um, before opening up, I would like to give you uh, an, another time the word uh, and ask you what, um, yeah, how is the influence of Europe in this? I think some of you have already pointed this out. And what would you, what should come next? What should be done now? And what should also the EU do in this context? And I would again like to start with Katie on this and then hand over. And please keep. Um, your input so short um, and max two minutes so we get another round of questions later on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I spoke about uh, mining of uh, metals and minerals and I, I, I didn't talk about uh, mining of construction materials, which is really problematic now in Georgia. And um, uh, well, a certain step that the government take, uh, I mean, to, to, reg to better regulate this, this sector, but there are certain things that uh, international financial institutions and donor countries could do to improve the situation in this area because they are allocating fund uh, finances to support infrastructure development projects in Georgia. And um, construction material, materials used for the projects uh, are not sourced sustainably. So they can make sure that they are sourced sustainably. And um, they could look um, at the broader impacts of the project support rather than merely concentrating on the impact of construction sites and uh, operations. Now, this is I wanted to mention also. Yeah. 
Yeah. And is there anything the EU could or should do now in the context of uh, supporting um, civil society at the moment? Well, maybe mm -hmm. just to keep an eye on the, the results of the elections and, uh, well, if questions arise, just to, I mean, just to support uh, our uh, legitimate claims, I would say, um, uh, after elections. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So fingers crossed on what this will happen yeah. and then yeah. we talk afterwards again. Uh, thank you, Katie. And hand over to Arthur, Arthur as well. What do you think, what could the EU do in this context or yeah, what's the involvement of the EU here now and what measures should be taken um, forward now? Mm -hmm. most urgent? You know, that's a bit tricky question. I know, uh, first... and you only have two minutes. That's short. I know, that's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's enough uh, to explain. It will be very brief. Uh, for the first, uh, we have, you know, this integration processes with the EU. We have separate agreement, which uh, imposes the country to have, you know, we have commitment to approximate the EU legislation, uh, EU policies, and uh, one of the directives of several, some of the directives are about public participation, decision-making, environmental impact assessments, and so on and so far. Currently, I'm doing the monitoring of uh, how far uh, the EU uh, legislation in terms of this, this agreement is uh, applied, is applicable or approximated uh, duly. Well, and it's not true. And so our government is saying that we ticked everything, so everything is okay, but everything is not okay. So this is the first instrument uh, that Armenia and EU had this uh, integration uh, processes and Armenia is committed to, um, to approximate the legislation and policies of the EU. So this is the first uh, leverage. The second issue uh, is what, what I'm saying is a bit tricky because if EU pushes too much, they can sell the ore material to China, to Russia, to Iran, and we have this practice. I mean, there is a, a company in Northern Armenia, operating in Northern Armenia, is under the sanctions, American and European sanctions, because the uh, owners are Russians. Uh, and they sell their production to three countries, Russia, China, and Iran. So, and uh, one of the, I mean, the, the part of the production is copper again, which is critical. So that's why I'm saying this is a bit tricky question, but the, the way is political integration, wider political integration with the EU. Okay, thanks a lot for this <laughs> very complicated aspect in, in two minutes and um, definitely to go more deeper into in the future. Um, Maida, Maida um, you, you already started off on this before uh, in the first round. Do you want to yeah. continue on this question? Yes, well... Uh... I wanted to say that there are quite worrying uh, promotional narratives coming not only from greenwashing from the mining companies, but also from some EU institutions, mining networks and alliances such as ERMA, so that the country has already existing mining tradition, proximity to EU, the EU market. It has like positive legal framework for mining, which is obviously not true. The project location, especially the lithium and magnesium projects in Bosnia, are very much in the vicinity of the transport rail and road network. Uh, so this is quite worrying because of the thing I mentioned before uh, in, in these areas um, that they should be protected. And uh, in our, um, we already have all of our we have uh, less than 3% protected areas in the country, and this should be the focus of the EU delegation and institutions for the country because the level of protected sites should be at least 17% and uh, let alone 30%, which is the uh, EU average. So uh, the, some of the recommendations, direct ones, should be uh, for, for DG near specifically, for DG growth, promoting these projects. Project says that they should halt the promotion and uh, focus more on the environmental aspect and, and this percentage that we need to achieve uh, regarding protected sites and obviously human rights as well. There should be no-go zones to mining specifically in these areas that should be protected. And uh, the green agenda is unfortunately misused in, in our country and causing also Euroscepticism also amongst the uh, environmental network as well, because it's being used and promoted only for you know, the green transition of uh, other countries, such as Germany or, or the EU itself, and not being used for 
uh, solving very important issues such as pollution issues. So meaning depollution, decarbonization of the country, which is heavily um, based on coal still. And of co obviously protected areas should be much higher. So uh, misusing the green agenda coming from the EU is something that is a big issue and should be uh, demystified in such way. So using green agenda for the right causes. Okay, thank you. And over to you, Petra. Uh, for me, I will try to be short, but right now I think it's most important, uh, I would say, to not directly intervene by supporting our authoritarian government, because uh, for common people in Serbia, it looks like now that uh, EU uh, supporting exploitation uh, of lithium in Serbia and this causing even uh, decreasing of level of support for, for EU. And do not forget about the, these other core values about democracy, human rights and other things which are really uh, problematical in, in Serbia. And also, I think it's important to talk about the, this uh, bigger and bigger state re repression toward activists, local citizens, uh, civil society organization, also political actors. I, I think th th these two are uh, important. Also, I think because all the, the this position of progressive political or uh, activist sector in Serbia who are pro EU, it's now in. Uh, tough position. They are in tough position because they are need to explain why they are pro EU and also to be against the, the, this project, which is look like that it's EU supported. And there is also a fight in Serbia how to break this narrative that EU is one homogeneous body, but it's more like heterogeneous things and uh, other things. And on the end, I think it's important that. The, this project, the other, it's not selected as a strategical project because then uh, tax, taxpayers of EU will give money for, for implementing the, these projects where local people in Serbia are against. Thanks a lot for your very concise and um, concrete answers on this. And we have um, the foot, uh, the luck that we have 10 minutes left, really, as we wished for, um, to um, have questions from you from the audience. There's the chance now to <laughs> raise your question. We can take two questions and um, please, you can, if you keep it short, um, please raise your hand and um, pose it in person. Who will be the ones? <laughs> question being raised here today. Michael Rekord. Thank you very much for the interesting uh, insight view. My name is Michael. I work for the Berlin-based organization PowerShift. And I would like to hear um, if there's any uh, national industrialization strategy in the countries uh, to use the raw materials to smelt them in your countries and go the next steps in the industrialization. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Anybody? If not, I have another one, which I want to pose together with, uh, uh, to ask you to answer to, together with the question of uh, Michael. And um, yeah, I wanted to, like, what gives, um, like, if you could choose now one measure um, to go urgently, I think you have somehow answered this um, before already, but if there's anything additionally want to mention in this regard. And what I would like to hear from you, what gives you hope that the situation at the moment, that the situation could change in future? And uh, yeah, what gives you hope in this context? And we make the other round around now than before. Pedrag, uh, Pedrag, I give you directly the word again <laughs> and then go the other way back to mm -hmm. About Michael, question. Uh... Fortunately, Serbia doesn't have the, the, this industrial strategy and how, how to keep, like, if you decide for exploitation of raw material, how to keep chain uh, value inside the country. And this is also big fear of, uh, of activists and uh, everyone who is fighting against that. Even government is uh, promising that we will have a battery factory, car factory or something like that. They don't trust this, especially because also... Uh, critical raw material act is saying that uh, 
10% of exploitation should be inside the EU, uh, but 40% should uh, come, uh, processing should come uh, from EU. And then uh, we are afraid that if uh, that this exploitation is happening, that they will export raw material. And even uh, government uh, talking that they will build this whole value chain, most people don't trust them because basically Serbia doesn't have a whole value chain for rosemary production, which is much more simpler than uh, lithium mine production. Thank you. Over to you, Maida. Okay. Uh, well, a similar study to what I just said, uh, we fortunately or unfortunately don't have uh, well-developed strategies even for this uh, industrialization in terms of um, um, recognizing mining um, as, as an important uh, part of the value chain. So um, nothing concrete but beyond like separate strategies made by uh, local authorities and companies themselves that they use for in for promotion of mining. Uh, uh, the other question is um, around uh, uh, what actually brings hope. Uh, in terms of Bosnia, say that uh, some municipalities, uh, local authorities, are quite resisting the mining, the new mining project. And we had elections just last week. Uh, some of the uh, mayors uh, actually met during the. Um, this month to um, sign declarations against mining, specifically for the lithium mining project in Lopere. Uh, so this kind of gives hope that uh, there should be some local authorities supporting also civil groups and, and citizens in the fight uh, against the new mining projects. Thank you. Over to you, Arthur. Thanks. Uh, so in terms of Armenia, we, as, as I told you, we export only our material. We don't have, uh, we had a couple of factories which uh, did some first stage processing, but it is not the metallurgy uh, as it is. It's not a, not a uh, metal, metallurgical um, infrastructure, but currently we don't have even that. Uh, and we export only the raw material itself, the concentrate, you know, this dust, <laughs> which uh, contains 25% of copper or something else. So uh, there are some plans. Uh, I told uh, during my presentation about the World Bank project on uh, development of mining, uh, strat mining industry, but it is uh, in the level of wishful thinking, uh, I would say. We uh, don't have not capacities of uh, financial uh, resources and even not a political will uh, to develop the real metallurgical sector. Uh, well, in terms of private projects, uh, yes, I, again, I indicated one of the um, mine, the biggest mining company, which uh, the share, shares of which was transformed from, from German to Russian owned. And during this process, there were again, this uh, Napoleon uh, plans to construct the big factories which will process the ore and then some nuclear stations should be uh, constructed uh, to feed the uh, needs of that factory but that all the uh, the, the whole i mean the, uh, all terms are passed already and nothing is done because of what because of corruption because not nobody in real nobody wanted to do this it, it everything was just on the paper Sorry, without uh, without any enthusiasm, <laughs> positive input. Thank you, Katie. Over to you. Yes, uh, uh, the value chain development actually is mentioned in the uh, national mining strategy that that I mentioned was adopted in two thousand nineteen, but uh, um, it hasn't been developed to any plan or uh, program or anything. So this is just referred in the mining strategy. Um, but um, uh, we have to also think of this the other side of value chain development, because if environmental, social, labor standards are not strengthened in hand in hand with this development of uh, supply chain, then we will have these devastating impacts on the local communities and the, the and the environment, similar to what I showed in uh, Giantura, for instance, today. So. Uh, yes, it's good to have this um, I mean, value chain, but 
it should uh, be developed uh, together with the strengthening environmental, social, and labor labor, labor standards. Um, and uh, as for the second question, I have to agree with Maita actually that the hope uh, the, the hope we have is the based on the um and the stronger resistance and stronger mobilization uh, within the communities actually that are facing this um type of development project uh, that uh, they are usually called so they are gaining experience and they 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 fight better for their rights yeah Thanks a lot for this. Now, just before ending, we have one more question. Linda Osuki, maybe you can pose it and then we can see if we can still answer it now or maybe if um, you get in touch later with the authors here to um, get uh, to answer it here to then close the um, webinar in time. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Linda Suski. I'm a freelance journalist. And I have a question to the organizers because you are the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, which is um, like close to the Green Party in Germany. And um, so the Green Party, like the Ministry um, of Economy, um, said that the project in Serbia is important. So I would like to know how, how um, like, how can you influence the debate um, and other di discussions inside the Green Party regarding um, uh, this project in Serbia and the support support for it from the German government? Yes, I think there are. There has just been maybe Katja, you go. Or you also want to go on to this? Um, there also has been one. I think there's split <laughs> split uh, positions there. We try to um raise the voice also with our partners in this context and um um have published a couple of um publications on this. Katja, you've just uh, highlighted one and to um um show the impacts and um yeah to spread um the word also on what what it could cause they have just last week there's been one uh well last week or two weeks ago there has been one statement a statement from the european greens also being um skeptical about the project katja do you want to add anything on this and then um i would like to thanks close for, um, the meeting um, for today thanks for this question that's pretty much um exactly what we are worrying about and um so so is our partners and um mm -hmm. We carefully have to monitor actually how um, how EU member states who are benefiting of those raw materials like lithium um, can guarantee for for those standards that are certainly not in place right now um, in countries with insufficient institutional capacities, environmental le legislation that is not sufficient, public consultation procedures that is lacking, as we just heard. Um, yeah, and the very general varying rule of law standards that we have in countries like like Serbia. And um, it's exactly our question, and we, we are backing our partners in, in the countries and try to advocate their perspectives um, towards um, politicians in, in Germany, and but also in Brussels. And yeah, we, we often hear that cl climate um, neutrality by 2050 for Europe can reach uh, only when there is 27 um, member states plus the partner countries. Um, trying hard, but what what will be the benefit for the resource rich countries in the end? This is also exactly our question. So, I, I would like to thank also to all our authors uh, contributing today. Um, as Johanna said, we are um, we are publishing those um, com comments um, from from our partners um, to widen the perspective. Yeah, and we closely have to monitor what um, what EU procedures will be on place to to guarantee any any needed standards uh, on spot and thanks a lot as well for the uh, our offices in Armenia the program uh, coordinators from uh, in Armenia Georgia Serbia and Bosnia Herzegovina without them also this work this joint work here in this group would not be possible thanks for that as well <clears throat> And thanks a lot for coming today and talk with us. And let's I think there's it was a lot to cover in this in this uh, um this session today and um looking forward to continue the discussion. Thank you.